Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I want to talk a little bit about body armor. Now, federal government hasn't passed any criminal laws that restrict the possession, use, or anything else of body armor, but some provinces have decided to legislate and pass their own restrictions. So these aren't crimes, but they are offenses. You can still be charged and convicted and punished for them. So let's have a look at Alberta's Body Armor Control Act. Uh, this is one example. Now, if you're in another province that has decided to restrict it, you're going to want to look at your own province's legislation. Uh, if you want, leave a comment, say, hey, can you look at this province? And maybe I can do that in a follow-up video. But for right now, I live in Alberta, so let's look at the Alberta rules. So this is the Body Armor Control Act. And the first thing I sort of want to look at is what does it say I can and can't do? And that is found in Section 3. Subject to Section 4, so there's a bunch of exceptions, no individual shall possess body armor without a valid permit issued under this Act. The next thing I want to know is, what does body armor mean when they say that I can't have body armor? So I go back up, have a look at the definitions, and it says, body armor means a garment or item, so it's not just limited to, you know, things you put on, but this would specifically include, for instance, plates for a plate carrier. Uh, designed, intended, or adapted for the purpose of uh, protecting the body from an item or object used to or adapted to stab, pierce, puncture, or otherwise wound the body. Now this is a very expansive definition, potentially, because one thing that comes up is when we look at a hard hat, here I'll just uh, let you guys see that a little more clearly, I don't know if this is included, because when you think about the things that it normally protects from, you know, it might protect from somebody dropping a tool from above and that tool lands on your head and would otherwise ruin your day and quite possibly shorten it substantially. But is that an item that's being used to or adapted to stab, pierce, puncture, or otherwise wound the body? I think a court could go either way. They could say, well, that's an accident. That's not an intentional activity. But if you were wearing that and somebody tried to stab you in the head, it would probably be pretty effective. Certainly a lot more effective than just not wearing it. So I don't know if it includes a hard hat and I don't want to spend the money to find out because that would be a very expensive court case. Nobody wants to be the person who helps figure out the law at their own expense. Now, they seem to have recognized this problem because they go and they start putting in a whole lot of exceptions. This starts with section two, which provides that this act doesn't apply to Safety equipment designed, intended for use, and worn by an individual for sports or recreational purposes. So your football pads, your, you know, kendo armor, your, you know, whatever. Uh, this is a metal mesh face mask that's designed for airsoft or paintball use. Maybe not the best for paintball, but it's designed to prevent little pellets from otherwise knocking out your teeth or injuring your face. That seems like it would be covered there. So they're saying, so long as you're wearing it for, and you know, it's designed for sports and recreational purposes. But I'll just grab this thing again. Let's say I decide to wear this out on a Halloween. Is that a sufficient recreational purpose? Is that a recreational purpose that they're contemplating in this? Maybe. What happens if I'm filming a movie and I decide, I'm going to use this as part of a prop in the movie. Is that now worn by an individual for sports or recreational purposes? I don't think so. That doesn't sound like it would fit in there. So this thing could theoretically transition if I use it the wrong way to being a regulated item. That's kind of a problem to my mind uh, because it's required that you're wearing it for that purpose. The next thing we get into is an even bigger problem. Section 2B, safety equipment or personal protective equipment designed, intended for use, and worn by an individual to protect an individual from injury in the course of the individual's employment and, so it also has to be, required by the Occupational Health and Safety Act, a regulation made under that act, or the OHS code within the meaning of that act. So they're recognizing that some pieces of protective gear you might want to wear at work because maybe you're a carpenter, maybe you're a butcher, and you're working with knives. Maybe you're doing all sorts of things that are dangerous. And so they're saying you might want to wear this. However, let's say you decide to be extra safe. 
the Occupational Health and Safety Act says you need this kind of armor, but you're saying, I'm going to go a step further and wear even more. You know, let's say you're a butcher, and I don't know if the Occupational Health and Safety Act says that you have to wear a chainmail glove, but let's say that you decide to, even though the act, and I'm, I'm just conjecturing here, I haven't checked, but, you know, you decide to wear something extra. Well, now you're not covered because it's only things that are required. This exception basically holds you to the minimum standard. If you want to be extra safe, you are potentially committing a very serious violation. And when I say very serious, the penalties go up to $10,000 in fines, six months in jail, or both. So this is not a small thing. The, also, the other thing you have to consider is that a lot of the protective gear that is used by people in trades is also used by hobbyists. You know, th when we think of the butcher's chainmail glove, a butcher might wear that in the course of work, but somebody who has simply gone out and shot a deer and is processing it themselves to save some money might also want that same gear. You know, a carpenter, you know, or somebody might wear a hard hat on the job site because it's required. But if you're just doing stuff yourself and it's not your employment, you might still want to wear the hard hat. You might still want to wear the protective gear. So this restriction doesn't help us all that much. It leaves all of these areas that maybe should be covered, but aren't. So that's a problem. And then see any other type of equipment designated in the regulations. So they recognized when they wrote this that they were probably missing categories that they'd have to cover off later, and they allowed themselves to do that. Now, they further have a whole bunch of exemptions here. So let's have a look at those. First exemption under 4A is police. Fair enough. You know, we have police running around in body armor. We don't want to start charging them. Section 4B is ambulance attendants also makes sense. Uh, C is inspectors under the Gaming, Liquor, and Cannabis Act. I'm not sure how often alcohol inspectors and gaming inspectors get shot at or stabbed, but fair ball. I, I can't see a problem with that. D is a security services licensee or an investigator licensee while acting in the scope of their authority and in the course of their employment or designation. Again, makes sense here. Uh, e is wildlife officers, so, you know, fish cops can also have body armor. F is an individual who's been issued a valid license under the Firearms Act, and this is a big important one. This basically says if you have a firearms license, then you are exempt entirely from the Body Armor Control Act, which is, even if you don't like guns, one of the best reasons to get a firearms license that I can think of. If you are not interested in going shooting and so forth, it basically says that your firearms license entitles you to wear protective gear that other people might not. Uh, G is a firefighter because, of course, firefighter's gear is all protective. Uh, H is a business owner if your business is dealing with uh, body armor. I is an individual authorized or permitted to wear body armor under the authority of an enactment. Um, and next is an individual designated in or described in the regulations for the purposes of this section. All right, so it's fairly clear that we're going to need to look at the regulations because they're going to add some more exceptions. So we'll go and have a look at that. Uh, the first set of exceptions is medieval or historical personal armor or reproduction of the same in a whole lot of contexts. So this is if you're doing a reenactment or a sporting event. Uh, this section here is for if it's on display. This is for if it's going to a museum or if it's for restoration or research or used for a collection display, costuming, or decoration, and anything that is a historic art or a historic item that is collected and stored by a museum. So if you've got a World War II flak jacket in a museum, that museum owner is not potentially looking at six months in custody. Note that this is a regulation that was brought in afterwards, so this is something they missed initially. Good that they fixed it, but it shows how expansive this rule can be and how it can catch sort of unintended behavior. So the next, they had to put in more individual exceptions. First, public officers, as described in section 11707 of the Criminal Code, which probably isn't you, but maybe you'll want to look at it. Next is individuals or museums who are collectors of these things. So again, uh, medieval or historical armor sort of gets broad exceptions. Uh, 
essentially there's there's a whole lot of exceptions for you know medieval armor for plate mail for chain mail etc so if you're a LARPer, this probably isn't going to affect you, but you are going to want to read this very carefully to make sure that you are within those exceptions or just get a firearms license because that way you don't have to worry about it. Firearms license is really the best way to go here. Uh, next is if you're involved in farming or ranching operations while engaged in those farming or ranching operations. So Alberta's got a fairly substantial tradition of respect and, you know, fondness for our farmers and ranchers so that goes in there next is individuals performing in an exhibition stampede rodeo fair or sporting event calgary stampede come to mind so that got covered off in there they didn't want to ban the calgary stampede and then this one is actually a later edition so when they first put out these right you know the first uh, batch of regulations this wasn't in there they had to add this in later this is individuals working directly with police officers where body armor is required by the police service policy. This is ride-alongs. What was happening is police have a policy now uh, where they say, if you want to do a ride-along with the police, then you have to wear body armor just in case, you know, somebody shoots at them. They don't want to get sued because they had somebody riding along with the police who wasn't wearing the same sort of protective gear the police are. But the Body Armor Control Act, up until they updated the regulations, said, you can't. So they had to fix that. Bit of a problem. So that's sort of our list of exceptions and so forth. Now, let's stop a little bit and think about the philosophy here, because what they're banning is protective gear. And the idea that they had is that they were seeing sort of gangsters wearing, you know, or owning this stuff. Uh, maybe they're concerned about other gangsters who are going to shoot at them, or maybe they were concerned about the police shooting at them. So they said, let's restrict this. Now, the penalties here in terms of the fines and, you know, gangsters don't typically care that much about fines because they tend to have income that is very difficult for the government to go after. You know, it's you can't garnish a drug dealer's wages. They're just, you know, they're not uh, filing tax forms. They're not any of that stuff. And six months is not really a big penalty when you're comparing it against somebody who's worried about getting killed. Most of us would rather do six months in custody than die. If you had to make the choice, it's not a hard choice. So in terms of the actual sort of threat to bad actors, it's not that much of a threat. But if you think about you're somebody who works at home and, you know, you want to process a deer and you want to get that chainmail glove, which, as I mentioned, doesn't seem to be covered by the exceptions here. You're kind of thinking 10,000 bucks or six months in custody or both is a big deal. So this is a much more effective tool for putting fear into people whose purposes are innocent than it is for putting fear into per people whose purposes are culpable. So one thing that sort of bothers me about this is the underlying philosophy. And the reason why I say that is that these are fundamentally defensive items. They're protective in nature. So they're intended to protect, you know, your life, your health, your safety. It's really hard to envision most of these things being used as a weapon. I mean, I guess you could hit somebody with a ceramic plate. They're fairly heavy, so maybe, but not so much. And we normally put this high premium on life, even when we're talking about people who are engaged in bad acts, who are in some fashion bad actors. So if you are a farmer and you look out the window and somebody is stealing your equipment, and this might be equipment that is necessary for you, know, you to bring in a harvest, for you to feed your cattle, for you to do any of necessary activities, we still say that you can't, for instance, lean out the window and take a shot at that person trying to you know trying to hit them because their uh, you know their sort of right to safety exceeds your right to even you know your financial stability this might be the end of your sort of way of life as you know it if your financial situation collapses as a result of this but you still can't take that shot so that's kind of the level we put preservation of life at a woman who has been the victim of domestic violence, who is being stalked by, you know, an angry ex-boyfriend who has made threats to her life, still is not allowed to 
store a loaded, loaded handgun in her bedside table in case that somebody attacks. Uh, Ian Thompson was ultimately acquitted, but the police dragged him through the ringer after people threw firebombs at his house and he used a firearm in self-defense, killing nobody. So that's kind of the premium that we put on sort of the safety of even people involved in bad acts. Now, one of the big proponents of this body armor regulation tends to be police forces, and one of the arguments they make is, listen, if people are wearing body armor and we shoot them, then they might not die. And normally society's philosophy is, okay, good. But apparently not when it's the police shooting somebody. When the police shoot somebody, it's important that they die for some reason. So I kind of have a problem with the sort of differential treatment there. And if we think another argument that gets made is, you know, gangsters are shooting at each other and if they're wearing body armor, then maybe they won't die. And I go, well, yeah, the whole point behind the rule that says that they can't shoot at each other is that maybe they'll die. So now them dying is a bad thing or is it a... I don't understand. Let's make up our mind as to where we want to land in terms of the, you know, is criminals surviving a good thing or is it a bad thing? Let's kind of decide this as a society, especially because, as mentioned before, these rules tend to apply or to sort of ward off criminals a lot less than they do sort of the average person. So let's kind of decide what we value, where we value life here when we're coming up with these rules. Is it that protection of life is paramount, in which case maybe get off our grill about having body armor, or is it we don't care about protection of life, in which case, you know, maybe we should cut Ian Thompson a bit of a break and not charge him when people are firebombing his house and he's trying to defend, you know, his life by not shooting anybody. So that just is one of these frustrations. I know you've seen me express many frustrations, and one of the things about understanding the law is that sometimes it becomes frustrating because the law doesn't always make sense. It's not always internally consistent, and it doesn't always accomplish what it sets out to accomplish. It doesn't always do what, uh, what even the people who wrote it want it to do, and I think this is an example. Uh, now I'll note here again, this is Alberta's body armor control uh, legislation. Different provinces have different rules. I haven't looked at all of them, but they have different definitions for what they count as body armor. They have different exceptions. They have different exemptions. So if you are in a province that has body armor control rules, you're going to want to look at your province's rules. And if you are contemplating some activity, you may want to talk to a lawyer about that. At any rate, Thank you for watching. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this. Please like, share, and subscribe. I uh, want to thank $30 Patreon supporter Steve Browning, $50 Patreon supporters George and Demo, as well as the $10 Patreon supporters immediately following in the crawl after this. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge.